it's all about the, having the perfect Christian life. And the, to have the perfect Christian life, we do this by having an ardent desire for Jesus, uh, continual prayer, unending prayer. Our lives should become prayer, universal mortification, right? So our Lenten practices are things that we can be doing sacrificial acts throughout our lives at all times. And finally, to have a tender and true devotion to our Blessed Virgin Mary because she will help us to reach these things. But each of these chapters focus on different parts of obtaining this eternal wisdom, obtaining Jesus Christ, and how how we must seek him and the origin of Jesus himself, or the you know, seeing eternal wisdom and creation and on and on and on. But there's one chapter in particular that is later on in this book, and it is about the unutterable sorrows which incarnate wisdom, Jesus, suffered for us. And St. Louis de Montfort goes into great detail and quoting scripture and quoting other saints in helping to paint a picture of the suffering that Jesus endured for our sake. And he writes that among all the motives which urge us to love Jesus Christ, incarnate wisdom, the strongest is, in my opinion, the sorrows which he endured to show us his love. So that's St. Louis Marie de Montfort. But then he quotes St. Bernard. And St. Bernard's um, images and the things that he says, uh, there is one motive which excels them all, which spurs one on more affectionately and urges me to love Jesus Christ. And it is, my good Jesus, the bitter chalice which you drink for us and the works of redemption which made you dear to our hearts. For this supreme blessing and incomparable token of thy love readily gains our love. So this idea, again, why did Jesus die on the cross? Yes, for our sins be forgiven, but because he loves you. Jesus died on the cross because he loves you. He loves you so much, he gave his life for you. He already did it. He gave his life for you because he loves you. And to understand that love is very difficult. But when we meditate on the sorrows of incarnate wisdom, the sorrows of Jesus Christ and what he suffered for us, St. Louis Marie de Montfort says, it is the circumstances circumstances which accompanied his sufferings that will make us realize more clearly the infinite love of eternal wisdom. And he breaks this down into a few different things. Number one, he breaks down to the excellence of his person. He's God, right? There's excellence in that. But then also the condition of us for whom he suffered, you know, so looking at our condition and we're just worms, right? We're, we're terrible sinners. And then lastly, the number and the severity of his sufferings. I'll admit there've been times in my life, this is very, very self-centered um, thinking when, when suffering is going on, not just for days or weeks, but for months and even years. And, and some people with, with debilitating illnesses can really relate to this. And there have been times in my life where mental suffering was so strong that it just went on and on and on. And it felt unfair that, and again, in my hubris and in my immaturity and in my lack of faith and my lack of hope in God, that there have been times where I've said, well, Jesus, you only had to suffer for three hours. Whoa. <laughs> uh, oh. And yeah. and I and, and I've had yeah. the thought I I would I would I would suffer everything you suffered for three hours if I didn't have to suffer the rest of this for the rest of my life, and it's hubris, right? That yeah. makes us think these kinds of things, yeah. and that's the devil uh, uh, putting things of temptation into our lives. Yeah. But to read this and to look at the suffering, the the number of sufferings. That he he endured the grievousness, right? The horrible nature of his sufferings. The number was so great that he was called a man of all sorrows, in whom there is no soundness from the sole of the foot until the top of his head. Meaning, there's no sound. There's no, there's nothing that you could hold on to. There's no soundness to it. Everything on him had been injured. There was nothing left that was sound on him anymore after his scourging, after his crucifixion, after the spitting, and after the beatings. This dear friend of ours, St. Louis Marie de Montfort says, this dear friend of our souls suffered in all things exteriorly and interiorly in his body and in his soul. 
He suffered in what he possessed for not to mention the poverty of his birth or his flight into Egypt and of his entire life. He was during his passion stripped by the soldiers who parted his garments amongst them and fixed him naked to the gibbet, not leaving him so much as a rag to cover his body. Humiliated, naked before all, naked before his mom, naked before Mary Magdalene, naked before St. John the Evangelist, naked before St. Longinus the soldier who would pierce his side with that spear, naked, bloody, and humiliated. And he suffered in his honor and reputation For he was overwhelmed with reproaches. He was called a blasphemer, a seducer, a wine drinker, a glutton, one having a devil. In his wisdom, he suffered because they treated him as an ignorant man, as an imposter, as a fool, as a madman. In his power, because they held him as a sorcerer and a magician who worked false miracles in a compact with the devil. They said all these things about him. In his disciples, one of whom sold and betrayed him, the first of whom denied him, the rest of whom abandoned him. He suffered from people of all kinds. Think about, here's a list of all the people who betrayed him, ignored him, mocked him, ridiculed him. From kings, governors, judges, courtiers, soldiers, pontiffs, priests, clerical and lay people, from Jews and Gentiles, from men and women, and in fact, everybody. And here's a powerful statement. Even his blessed mother added dreadfully to his affliction when, as he was dying, he saw her standing at the foot of the cross, immersed in an ocean of sadness. So even seeing the sorrow that his suffering was causing his mother, he then endured that suffering. So it was the circle between the two of them. Our dear Savior also suffered in all the members of his body. His head was crowned with thorns. Hairs were torn from his head and beard. His cheeks were buffeted. His face was spit upon. His neck and his arms were bound with cords. His shoulders were bent and bruised by the weight of the cross. His hands and feet were pierced by nails. His side and his heart opened by a lance. His whole body pitilessly lacerated by more than 5,000 strokes of the scourge so that his almost fleshless bones became visible to the eye. His five senses were also immersed in this sea of suffering. Sight, when he beheld the mocking faces of his enemies and the tears of grief of his friends. Hearing, when he heard the insults, the false testimonies, the calumnies, and the horrible blasphemies which accursed lips uttered against him. Smell, when tortured by the stench of the filth which was hurled in his face, taste by the feverish thirst which his executioners increased by giving him gall and vinegar vinegar to drink, touch by the excruciating pains caused by the lashes, the thorns, and the nails. So you, we always jump to the touch. The touch is the last thing, but all those things and more. And he did all these things. His most holy soul was grievously tormented because of the sins of all men. All these sins of ours that were so many outrages against God our Father, His Father, whom Jesus infinitely loved. They were the cause of the damnation of so many souls that would be lost despite Jesus' passion and death because they denied Jesus and they turned away and they did not receive the reconciliation. They were never contrite. They never were willing to carry their own crosses. They were never willing to suffer along with our Savior. Jesus was also tormented because he had compassion not only upon all men in general, but upon everyone, you in particular, as he knows you individually. He goes on and on. But I thought that that was a good meditation a visualization. It's hard not to imagine those things very clearly. 